What is a tank? It might seem like a very simple question, but it's not an easy one to answer. To realize how big the problem is, take a look at an encyclopedia. It will say something like, a tank is an armored fighting vehicle, typically tracked and carrying a cannon as main armament. This description is very loose. Since there's no ready answer, we'll have to find it for ourselves. You are what you do. You build, you're a builder. You fly, you're a pilot. Let's see what tanks were designed to do in the past and how their role has evolved since. It's not exactly known when the first armored fighting vehicle appeared. Some historians point to the armored siege engines of the ancient Greek era, medieval horse armor, and the fantastic blueprints drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. Something more familiar started to take shape in the early years of the 20th century. There's little information about these projects, and the stories were similar to some extent, so they can even be put together. One day, in Great Britain, or maybe in Austria, or maybe in France, in or around 1912, a plumber, or according to some versions, a pipe fit, came up with an idea for an unusual combat vehicle. After a couple of sleepless nights, the draft was ready. The inventive plumber went to the appropriate military department with his proposal. He was already dreaming of fame and honor. However, the commission came back with an answer that was quite unexpected. The military didn't need tanks. There was no place for them either in theory or in the practice of military art. But then the First World War broke out. After a short period of active movement, the opposing armies dug in with trenches bristling with machine guns and covered in barbed wire. Even if a defense line could be broken through at the cost of enormous casualties, armies had trouble carrying forward the advance. The standard methods didn't work. Military strategists realized that they needed something new to crack a deeply echelon defense. In 1914, Sir Ernest Swinton, a British officer, engineer, and aristocrat, presented his design for an armed and armored tractor. Its working name was a machine gun destroyer. The British Army took no interest in the project. The first person who saw the potential in the new proposal was the First Lord of the Admiralty, Sir Winston Churchill. He allocated money, and on February the 20th, 1915, the Land Ships Committee was created. Development was rapid, and on September the 10th, the first tank in history, Little Willie, was tested. It failed the tests because it couldn't perform a key requirement, crossing trenches and ditches. Engineers improved the prototype and mass production began. The vehicle was given an unpretentious name, the Mark I. Its shape seems bizarre to us today, but having the tracks go all the way around the hull solved the problem of ditch and trench crossing. This was a land ship in more than just name. Many design details were borrowed from the Navy. The tank was armed with naval guns, which were mounted in sponsons, just like the guns on cruisers of that period. Even its engine was initially designed for a towing car used by the Navy. The work on the first batch was done at several factories. To conceal the project, the government spread the story that the vehicles were field reservoirs for water, ordered by the Russian army. In correspondence, the vehicles were called tanks. On September the 15th, 1916, Land ships, already nicknamed tanks, engaged in their first combat near the Somme River. 32 of the vehicles moved into battle over muddy ground, hoping for a miracle. Five tanks became stuck and nine broke down, but the 18 remaining vehicles managed a breakthrough that pierced five kilometers into enemy territory. British casualties were far lighter than usual. The miracle had happened. The huge steel monsters with machine guns terrified the German soldiers and gave the British hope that this new weapon might win the war. A year later, the Germans, in response to the British land ship, rolled out their mobile fort, the A7V. This tank had the largest number of crewmen in history. It was designed for the same role as the Mark I, to help the infantry break through the enemy defense lines. In the very first period of tank building, there was a single answer to the question, what is a tank? 
For the Germans and British, it was a sort of ram to help the infantry batter through enemy defences. However, the French brought a different approach. The father of French tank building was Colonel Jean-Baptiste Estienne. He wrote in August 1915, Gentlemen, victory in this war will go to the side that first manages to mount a 75mm gun on a vehicle capable of crossing any terrain. And he was right. When the first tanks appeared, Colonel Estienne looked at them and decided that the army needed something different to support the infantry. It should be light, small, maneuverable and cheap. With this idea in mind, he went to the largest French manufacturer, Louis Renault. This is how the new vehicle, very unlike the land ships, appeared. It had two crewmen, a driver who controlled the tank and a commander who did everything else. The tank was armed with a single machine gun or a 37mm short-barreled cannon. Nevertheless, the Renault FT-17 became the most successful means of infantry support and the main vehicle of the French armoured forces. Many countries became interested in creating their own tanks after World War I. The military of most countries saw the tanks as reinforcements for the traditional military branches, above all, the infantry. The French and British separated their tanks into infantry tanks and cavalry or cruiser tanks. The USSR had five main tank types, reconnaissance, combined arms, operational, qualitative reinforcement and special operations vehicles. These were supplemented with seven special types. So both theoretical and practical work on the definition of tank was humming along. In the late 1930s, tanks started getting heavier. The age of thinly armoured tanks had come to an end. The turning point was the Spanish Civil War. It became clear that infantry, at least in Europe, was capable of defeating tanks. Light, small calibre, quick-firing cannons and heavy machine guns had no trouble perforating them. As soon as the early 20th century, the Germans had started to develop a theory of lightning war. Blitzkrieg. They weren't able to fully implement this idea during World War I, but they continued to refine the concept. By the new rules, Blitzkrieg should be carried out by large tank formations. Now their task was not to support infantry, but to break through, punching deep into the enemy defences. Tanks were no longer expected to fight with field defences. They should wreak chaos in the enemy rear, overrunning enemy headquarters, capturing transport routes and supply depots and breaking up enemy forces attempting to reinforce. Victory would be achieved by disrupting enemy communication and supply. The modern army is not a Roman legion. It can't fight without gasoline and ammunition. According to the Germans, tanks were not a supplementary means of warfare, but the most powerful offensive weapons. All other forces should serve their interests. The role of supporting the infantry was given to another vehicle type, assault guns. Two tanks were created to fit this theory, the Panzerkampfwagen 3 and 4. They complemented each other on the battlefield. The Panzer 3 was designed as the main Wehrmacht tank. It was intended to be used to attack points without heavy anti-tank defenses. It was designed to fight, not vehicles, but infantry. That's why its armament maximized the number of weapons and rate of fire. It was armed with three machine guns and a 37mm cannon. This armament was supplemented by an excellent observation system. The Panzer IVs were to support the Panzer III's. Its short-barreled 75mm gun was good at dealing with enemy artillery and field fortifications. The German tank divisions proved the theories of the general staff officers by smashing the French army in just a few weeks. France had more tanks, and their technical characteristics were not inferior. It was the way they were used that was obsolete. The Panzer IIIs and IVs played their roles perfectly at the beginning of the German invasion in the USSR. But then, rather suddenly, things started to go wrong. The Panzers were being forced to do something their creators hadn't planned, fight against a new generation of tanks. In the USSR, armoured vehicles had traditionally been designed with greatest attention paid to two attributes. Mobility, understandable considering the distances and quality of roads in the USSR, and firepower. A third factor was added after the Spanish Civil War. The tanks of the new generation, 
the T-50, T-34 and KV-1 received armor designed to defeat enemy shells. These tanks emerged as excellent vehicles with balanced characteristics. Realizing that they would have to fight masses of Soviet armored vehicles, the Germans revised their views on what tanks should do. The anti-tank role became the priority. New panzers, like the Panther, for example, had long-barreled guns and thicker armor. No longer were they envisioned conducting lightning-fast attacks on the enemy rear. Now they were built to fight enemy tanks. The ambition of the German military and designers to achieve qualitative superiority in armor and armament by any means became a sort of mania. The Tiger appeared in 1942. It was good, but not big enough. The engineers designed the mouse. Also not big enough. They made it a little bit bigger and got the ratter. Someone said, too small, and this project turned into a 1,500-ton monster. But only on paper. If the Third Reich's tank designers had had more time, perhaps we would have seen something even bigger. In the period immediately after the end of World War II, there was still no single answer to the question, what is a tank? Actually, there were two answers. Medium tanks, the workhorses of armored forces, and heavy tanks and assault guns which would be deployed as reinforcement in offense and defense. The military wanted to have one type of tank for both roles, but the engineers couldn't deliver it. They were limited by technology, especially in engine power and transmission. In the late 1950s, the British designed a 105 mm tank gun that, just like the Beatles, became very popular in all the Western countries. It was used in the Centurion 7 and M60, and then in the M48 Pattern 3 and Leopard 1. The reason for its success was simple. A medium tank equipped with this gun could penetrate the Soviet heavy tanks head-on. Besides an excellent armor-piercing shell, the gun could fire powerful, high-explosive shells. In response, the Soviet 115mm smooth-bore gun appeared. It did the same thing against the NATO heavy tanks. It could penetrate their front armor with certainty. After the British L7 rifled gun and Soviet smooth bore gun entered mass production, heavy tank development shut down in all countries. Heavy tanks were still used, but MBTs, main battle tanks, gradually replaced them. The designers had managed to create vehicles that were fast, well armored, and heavily armed all at the same time. The curse had been lifted. Vehicles of the new type finally made it very simple to answer the question. What is a tank? It's a versatile combat vehicle with good firepower, strong armor, and high maneuverability, capable of breaking through a defense or defending a certain area. When tanks first appeared, they were exotic machines designed to overcome the deadlock of trench warfare. Now they are a mainstay of modern ground forces. It is sometimes said that tanks are out of fashion but they seem unlikely to give their place to something else in the near future. <laughs>